The U.N. A refugee agency says more than 5 million people have now fled Ukraine since the Russian invasion began. Russian troops, meanwhile, have intensified their assault on Mariupol. Video shared by Moscow shows smoke rising from a steel plant in the city. Overnight, Russia bombed the fortified facility where thousands of Ukrainian troops and civilians are believed to be holding out. The Kremlin has called on fighters there to surrender. Charlie Daggett has the details. Charlie, good morning. Good morning to you, Vlad. Another deadline, another ultimatum has come and gone in Mariupol for Ukrainian forces to surrender. Uh, both sides had agreed on a humanitarian corridor, but fighting rages in the east and in the south. Drone footage shows a city torn apart after weeks of bombardment. Residential neighborhoods flattened. Beneath the Azovstal iron and steelworks plant, women and children huddle together in bomb shelters, too terrified to attempt an escape. A Ukrainian Marine makes a desperate plea. We're facing our last days, if not last hours. The enemy outnumbers us 10 to 1. And the enemy is closing in fast. Russian soldiers surround the steel plant, hunting down remaining fighters. Russia has intensified attacks along a 500-mile front line, advancing forward and reinforcing regions already under occupation, including the hard-fought Zaporizhzhia nuclear facility, Europe's largest. The nuclear power plant remains under Russian control in Russian-held territory on that side of the river. This is Ukrainian-held territory. Nearby, they've been counting the cost of the war. A Russian anti-tank mine took the life of 29-year-old paratrooper Vyacheslav Dimov on Saturday. How important was it for your son to fight for his country? It was very important. He dreamed like crazy of becoming a soldier, his mother Allah said. But I didn't bring him into this world for war, but for a peaceful life, so he could live with his beloved wife, Ivana. His beloved wife, Ivana, and he had only been married for 18 months. They were planning to start a family when the war broke out. The 23-year-old widow told us about their last video call, saying she knew that every call might be the last one. Every time we spoke, I told him, I love you, look after yourself, she said. And now I say, I love you, look after me. Ivana told us she didn't want to believe it when she heard the news of his death, but when it sunk in, her world shattered like a jigsaw puzzle. Vlad and Elaine? It's just heartbreaking to hear that. Charlie, you traveled to the front lines for this report. Tell us what you saw. What was it like there in eastern Ukraine? Well, Elaine, I, I, I want to sort of paint the picture. So when we talk about the front lines, you know, it's not ditches. It's not places that are coming under mortar attack or small arms fire. But you get to the very last area of control for Ukrainian forces. And that's where we were along that river. So on the other side of the river, all of that was un under Russian control. On this side, it's under Ukrainian control. And they warned us. They said, you have to be careful out there. We needed to get an escort. They don't like us showing their defensive positions. But that front line is a stagnant front line. We were a little bit concerned about being, you know, within firing range from Russian artillery. But it was a foggy day. They said they haven't been fired on for a number of days. So you have active front lines, dynamic front lines, that the military sometimes calls as kinetic, when you've got incoming fire and artillery. Uh, we obviously had our flak jackets on because the, the danger was there. But here in Dnipro, even here would be considered a frontline city uh, because it has come under attack. But there are areas where it's been active along the east in Kharkiv, in Chernihiv before, uh, certainly Mariupol. Those are the frontline areas where you've got Russians who are attacking and Ukrainians on the counterattack, you know, where they're in trenches and really fighting this combat. So, yes, it is a front line in terms of delineation. You've got Ukrainian forces on one side, Russian forces on another. That is liable to change, and it sometimes changes very quickly. So, yes, we were on the front lines, but the atmosphere there, uh, it's, it's worrying, it's concerning for the residents because they know anything could happen at any time, but it's not dynamic. They're not being fired on. So, Charlie, what can you tell us about that agreement to create a humanitarian quarter out of Mariupol? 
Well, Vlad, you know, sadly, we've been talking for weeks about these humanitarian corridors. I've lost count on how many of these humanita humanitarian corridors have been agreed upon and in place. And there are two sticking points to this. One of them is the fact that the Russians own all of the territory around Mariupol, right, and around Kherson. So either way, to the left and to the right, they own that territory. Frankly, the civilians there, and certainly the military there, just do not trust that the Russians are going to hold fire. And we've seen that. We've seen it in Irpin. We've seen it in Bucha, we, we're, where the Russians have agreed on a ceasefire. Uh, civilians have tried to flee the area, and they've come under fire. So there's a distrust that that ceasefire is going to hold. Um, and the Russians uh, continue to... Um, uh, to break that sort of ceasefire agreement in terms of that humanitarian corridor. Now, we are coming to a pinch point. Uh, from what we understand, about 120 uh, civilians were able to get away from that area because now the place is utterly surrounded uh, in, in certain terms that the, uh, the Ukrainians have run out of options. So, as you saw in that report, there are a number of civilians who have taken uh, shelter beneath that, uh, that steel plant. Uh, and, and it's worth noting, by the way, there's there's a network of tunnels and bunkers that were already in place. It is made to withstand actually what is happening now. So that can go on in terms of the troops, the Ukrainian forces that are there uh, for some time. But it's the civilians who are just terrified because it would mean trusting um, the Russians that this humanitarian uh, corridor will be honored. And plus, they have to arrange the transport. So, yes, we would hope that the humanitarian corridor this time might turn into something where civilian lives can be saved. But at the moment, we're not seeing this mass rush of hundreds or thousands of civilians out of that port city. It's certainly understandable why Ukrainians would be skeptical of Russians keeping their word when it comes to humanitarian efforts. All right, Charlie Daggett in Ukraine for us. Charlie, thank you.